in the last episode, our hero, along with all of the other adventurers of the labyrinth were sent back into their homeland, the Earth, due to the mandatory quests. Tie in Ghosty Medium, the hard mode player, and joined his group. Our hero's ethereal company is getting increasingly frustrated after finding out that Jung is doing all the work, killing the monsters to protect the other adventurers. He asks Tai, why is there a huge difference between him, Jung, and the other adventurers who are cowardly hiding whenever there are monsters appearing, emphasizing that they are all facing the same dangers inside the labyrinth. It would seem that Ghosty isn't aware about the different difficulties between the labyrinth mode, prompting our hero to have a serious conversation with him. Tai enlightens the spirit warrior that there are actually different modes that the adventurers can choose from, easy, normal, hard, and solo. Each mode has a different configuration of monsters and bosses on each floor. However, the shape of each floor and the monsters on the 100th floor are still the same for any difficulty. The ghost comments that the maze he knows isn't separated, unlike from our hero's description. He states that there would be times that the dimensions will be separated by the gods, but it ultimately returns to its original form. Ghosty whispers and asks Tai if such diversity was created by someone artificially. He states that if it was an existence that didn't know how to design an extraordinary maze and just carelessly copied and pasted the floors, then this whole situation can be explained. However, considering the scale of the labyrinth, even that must be difficult to do, leaving the two wondering why someone would go through all this trouble just to create different labyrinth difficulties. Our hero contemplates the possibility that the one who did it was someone at the level of a god or even higher, considering how intricate it is. As he thinks deeper, Tai realizes that the monsters that have appeared on Earth right now are just F-class monsters. Although they are still difficult to handle for a normal adventure, they are still not strong enough to completely wipe the human off the face of the planet. If that mysterious existence really intended to kill the humans, he would have sent a class monsters, but he controlled the output as if he is watching over the adventurers. This fact prompted our hero to recall that the gods like it, when mortals show their great efforts. I don't know if they just want to be inspired by humanity's dedication and hard work or they're just plain sadists. Nonetheless, one thing is for sure, them gods are bored as fuck. Our hero's deep thinking is then interrupted by Ghosty, who more bored than those gods right now, from watching the pathetic adventurers. He asks Tai if they can't just go to their destination right away, wanting to leave the group as soon as possible. In response, Tai states that they can't do that as of now, besides, there's nothing for them to do anyway if they go there early. Growing increasingly frustrated, our hero's ethereal companion throws a tantrum on his head, telling Tai to just help the pathetic humans blatantly and stop doing it in a secret way, but our hero remarks that he doesn't enjoy being the hero that much. Tai reveals that he is helping the group specifically because of Young, revealing that the young adventurer is someone who our hero can give his affection to and survive with until the end. Our cold-blooded hero really doesn't care whether the other adventurers live or die, but if they do die, he knows that it will eat Young from the inside, and he will lose his strong mentality. You see, in Tai's previous life, Young Jun also led the weak under his protection, but he ultimately failed in the end. When the young adventurer reached the city hall, he was all alone. Time passes by and the dusk is breaking. Knowing that the night will arrive, the group opted to rest inside an abandoned building and hide from the monsters, so that they can replenish their energy and eat. They gobble up some monsters' meat and are repulsed by how bad the taste is, but considering their situation, one can't afford to be picky. The people whine and expresses their regret of not having to go to a convenience store and pick something up. Now I'm really taking Ghosty's side, these noobs are really irritating. Meanwhile, as the others are crying over their awful meal, our hero lavishly enjoys the ham he picked up along the way. The others can't help but gossip and murmur of how delicious our hero's food might be. Suddenly, one of the weaklings approaches Tai, thinking that he is an easy target. A muscular man with a blonde hair confronts him, telling our hero that he surely must have heard of him if he claims to be in a normal difficulty mode. The punk is revealed to be Li Chang Xiaok, the leader of the Athene Guild, and it seems that he is famous as he claims, as other adventurers recognize him, pitying our hero for having to deal with the punk. The thug threatens our hero for his food, saying that if Tai doesn't want to die when he returns to the maze, he better hand his food over. Despite this, our hero just casually chewed his food. Tai then comments that he isn't sure whether Li could actually return to the labyrinth after this mandatory quest, aggravating the thug's mood even further. With that short exchange of words, our hero opted to return to his meal, closing his eyes and ignoring the arrogant bastard. Although it almost slipped his mind, our hero was able to recall the bad reputation of the Athene Guild from his previous life. According to him, they are a bunch of bullies that abuses their power and try to take control of the labyrinth. Li's patient then runs out and asks our hero to square up. He pulls back his fist in an attempt to launch a punch at Tai. Suddenly, Jung interrupts him, commanding the thug to stop. Lee tells Jung to back the hell up, stating that this is his own personal problem and that he should stay out of it. While the arrogant bastard is still yapping and complaining, the young adventurer abruptly grabs him by his face and lifts him up into the air. 
they try desperately to escape Young's grasps, but it is all proving for naught as the difference between their strength is massive. Cold sweat drips down the bastard's face as he realizes that he just fucked around and is now about to find out. Young then looks Lee straight into his soul, and then, in a still polite manner, he states that everyone has the freedom to do anything they want, but if they choose to cross the line, there will be consequences. He then punches the so-called leader of the Athene guild on the shoulder. Albeit the punch wasn't in full force, it was enough to make the bastard roll into the ground from the agonizing pain. Young emphasizes that it is absolutely not a problem for him to throw Lee away at any time, showcasing his authority to the other adventurers. As he walks away, the weak shit people look at him with scared expression on their faces. They comment that this is the first time they ever saw Young act that way. As for our hero, he still kept his mouth shut and continued to observe the situation. Later that night, Jung opted to be alone outside the shelter to keep watch for possible monsters. We can really tell that he didn't want to act that stern in front of the others, but the situation forced him to. Suddenly, our hero arrives, complimenting the young leader for his diligence to do night watches even though he is the one most exhausted from the battles earlier. Tai then comments that what Jung did earlier scare the people, saying that they felt worried that they might be discarded from the group. In response, Jung stated that he had no other choice. He had to do something after all. He is aware that there are too many people for him to protect alone, so in order to survive together, he has to make them obey his words. He then thanks Tai for giving him the opportunity to demonstrate his authority, albeit making the other people fear him. Our hero then asks him if he really need to go this far just for the sake of others. Young seemed to be confused by our hero's question, inquiring Tai what he meant by his words. Tai then remarks that Young is aware he will be able to reach the city hall easily if he was alone. Being summoned from the hard mode, Jung is well aware that people who are meant to live will live, and those who aren't, will die. The kind-hearted man is horrified by our hero's words, but unfortunately, he cannot deny them, leaving him with a confused expression on his face. You see, the probability of surviving in hard mode is merely 1%. So, just like Jung, when one experiences that mode, even just for a short while, they will definitely understand that even if they help someone who has no chance of surviving, that person will still die in the end. Our hero then gets straight to the point. In a cold and calm manner, Tai asks the young adventurer why he is so obsessed with those people who will eventually die. Those words triggered Young. He angrily questioned our hero why he would say such a thing to those poor adventurers. But when he looked Tai into the eyes, he senses that our hero is someone who has seen countless of deaths. Young then concludes that Tai isn't actually someone from normal mode. The air he emits is totally different from any players he has encountered. Threatened by his presence, the young adventurer grabs his sword and takes his defensive stance against our hero. Even though he is clearly shaking in fear, Jung asks Tai for his real identity. Our hero remarks that this is the first time he has ever seen Jung make such an expression. He then turns around the comments that Jung is someone who has a goal in mind. As he walks away, our hero tells the young man that he will reveal everything once they reach the city hall. The valiant leader was left staring at our hero until his silhouette disappears in the dark. He then ponders about who that man cloaked with mysteries really is. The morning then arrives, and Jung promptly wakes up all the other adventurers. He informs them that they will be arriving the city hall in two hours if they kept their pace, delighting the people with his words. The group then continued their march, with Jung leading the pack. However, there are some things that they have overlooked. Firstly, monsters will only attack humans who are heading to the city hall, meaning people who are trying to complete the quest. Second, those who go there independently are either already in the city hall or are already dead. Worm-like monsters started appearing. Seeing their numbers, Jung hurriedly tells everyone to run and get going, knowing that he will not be able to face all of the beasts alone. The people quickly followed his command, but they are all engulfed in fear as they run for their miserable lives. One kid gets left behind and was about to get devoured by the monster. Fortunately, Jung made it in time and was able to shield the child from the attack. The situation is getting dire for the lone hero. He is aware that he doesn't have the capability to fend off multiple enemies at once while still protecting the citizens. However, the city hall is just in front of them. Jung devoted himself into buying time until the people reaches their destination. He quickly activates his skill, Breathless Strike, giving him freedom of breathing for 10 seconds. The enemies charge towards him, and the young leader valiantly confronted them with all his might. He then throws calmness powder to the beasts, which explodes when it comes in contact with the monsters and creates a smoke screen. With the help of the item, Jung was able to buy some time and distance away from the enemies. He smiles after figuring out the most successful strategy. However, as he turns around to check up on the other adventurers, he was surprised to see that the people haven't left yet. As it turns out, they are encircled by other monsters coming from different directions. Realizing the dire situation, all the people yelled for Jung's help, asking the lone hero what to do next. The pressure and anxiety are starting to get through the valiant leader's mentality. He can't think of ways of how to get out of this predicament. Jung no longer has any useful items that will help them escape, and fighting the monster all at once by himself is out of the question. But if he just focused on one battle, he knows that everyone will die. Stuck between a rock and a hard place, the thought of running away on his own crosses his mind. 
he surmises that he might be able to live, since his strength and speed are equal to the monsters, and he will not have a hard time dodging the attacks as well if he just moves quickly. As he was contemplating these thoughts, the people all looked at him with pleading eyes, begging him for his help. The young hero becomes nauseous from the wicked thoughts, but he cannot discard them as it is the only realistic and practical solution. But the fact that he was the one who chose to gather all the people and take them under his wing is eating his conscience. He thinks that if he is just going to abandon them like this, he shouldn't have saved them in the first place. His honor dictates that if he's going to protect the people, then he should protect them until the very end. Young Jun is indeed a good person at heart, but it is not to the point that he is willing to sacrifice himself for others. Right now, all he wishes is strength, the power to destroy all adversaries in front of him. Our hero finally butts in and asks the young man if he's planning to escape. It is a very cruel question, but a very important one. Tears began falling from Jung's eyes as he stares at our hero intensely and queries if he's to be blamed for considering such thoughts. Everyone is silently observing the two as they converse with each other, while the monsters are paralyzed in their position. Seems like our hero did something without anyone noticing. To answer Jung's question, Tai states that he won't guilt trip him no matter what choice he makes, he was just curious to know. As he was uttering those words, he slowly manifests his radiant frost sword and prepares himself for some action. Seeing Jung act like this, our hero wonders what really happened to him in Tai's previous life. Different kinds of emotions surged into Jung's heart. Even though he is thinking of escaping and leaving everyone behind, his nature isn't allowing him. All he can do is weep and fantasize of having the strength to save everyone. Suddenly, a monster creeps up behind him, but it was immediately cut in half by a swift strike that came out of nowhere. Jung falls down on his bum as our hero moves in lightning speed, hacking and slashing the ugly beasts behind him. Everyone has the same shocked expression on their faces from our hero's display of strength, but the one most surprised is none other than Jung himself. Three red beasts sneak their way behind our hero and launches a surprise attack. However, Tai just casually incinerated them without putting much effort using his fire magic. And with the horde gone, our hero prompts the people to head to the city hall. The scene then shifts to the city hall, the destination of the adventurers. In there, families and friends who have chosen different modes in the labyrinths were finally able to reunite. The other people notice the large group of people led by Jung commenting that this is their first time seeing such a flock of adventurers reach the city hall together. They attributed that success to Jung, wondering if the young adventurer is from the hard mode. Jung tries to deny this and wanted to make clear that Tai was the one who saved them all, but our hero placed his hand on Jung's shoulder and gestured him not to do so. Suddenly, one adventurer prompts everyone to gather up, saying that he will escort them. Although the city hall might seem to be filled with people, the total current population is still a far cry from the initial population of any Yang, which was 500,000. Right now, Tai calculates that there are only 100,000 survivors left. Our hero peacefully resting in a corner when Jung approaches him and offers a bottle of water. It seems like the young adventurer has finally pieced together our boy's identity, saying that he felt the need to greet him, addressing him as solo mode player, Mr. Tai. As our hero accepts the offer, he commends Jung for acquiring the breathless strike. In response, the young man gives all the credits to Tai, saying that it is all thanks to him that he was able to learn it. Jung reveals that he is still doubtful about some of the posts in the community board. He admittedly states that he first thought that it was impossible to acquire the skill. The young adventurer then expresses his sincere gratitude towards Tai, thanking him for saving the people. Because of his timely interruption, Jung wasn't forced to make such a disgusting choice like escaping on his own. In response, Tai tells him that it was no problem at all, saying that he did it because he wanted to and not because he was compelled to help. He then praises Jung for the kid's valiancy, emphasizing that it was Jung's own decision to lead the group of the weak and protect them in the first place. The young man was touched by our hero's words, prompting him to grab his hand and express his most sincere gratitude for not only sharing the ways of how to acquire necessary skills in the dungeon, but for literally saving their lives as well. However, the kid is getting swayed by his emotions too much, prompting our hero to throw his water bottle into Jung's face to calm him down. Jung stares at our hero with glimmering eyes as if he is gazing at his idol. It looks like Tai is weak in this kind of interaction. In his mind, he wonders what has gotten into the young man's head, emphasizing that he wasn't this friendly before. Suddenly, Huey Yeon interrupts the two, looking for Young Jun, saving our hero from the awkward interaction. She informs Young that she has something to explain about the current situation, but she stops mid-sentence to inquire about the identity of our hero. It seems like Yeon is a very influential figure from our hero's past life as well, as he was able to identify her as someone who is a leader in the hard mode. On the other hand, Jung proudly introduces our boy as Kang Tai San from solo mode. Yeon recognizes our hero as someone who talks a lot in the community board. I don't know if that's comforting to hear or not. The lady then invites our hero as well, informing them that there are at least a hundred thousand people gathered at the city hall. However, the problem is, among all those people, there are only a thousand adventurers who can face the monsters. She regrettably states that it is because most of the people gathered here are from the normal and easy mode, so their experience, let alone their strength, is too little. To add more to the dilemma, they have a serious shortage of food and places to sleep. 
One more thing that troubles them is that they haven't found someone to lead all the people yet. Young then remarks that Yeon should obviously be the one to command them, to which the lady acknowledges. However, she states that when she tried to do that, a guy from the easy mode named Choi Young Hyuk ran wild to get himself the right to command. Our hero's eyes widen as he hears the name of the bastard. Choi is none other than the arrogant fuck who kept on dissing our hero in the community board. Yeon shares that during her interaction with Choi, she brought up that there is no way a person who can't even kill a single monster on his own lead a whole 100,000 people. But then, Choi raised his voice, asking if Yeon is looking down on the people from the easy mode, trying to earn the sympathy of his fellow weaklings. She shares that the bastard is even holding some hostages to win his point. Seeing that he has a captive, Huey Yeon opted not to confront Choi recklessly and decided to postpone her decision. Curious, Yeon asks who Choi's captives were, showing great concern on his face. Huey reveals that they are Lee Tion and Kang Jun. Suddenly, a sinister aura is emitted from our hero as he asks for more details of the two getting caught by the bastard. Unfortunately, Huey states that she doesn't know the details of their capture. All she knows is that they have been detained ever since they came to the city hall. This prompted our hero to face palm his face. He is confident that the two are strong enough to win against Choi. Heck, they can even match Young's strength according to Tai. This led him to think that there is something else that forced the two to be Choi's hostages. Young asks if there is something they can do about the situation, to which Huey states that they should monitor it first before intervening. As of now, there are no casualties, so she thinks that it would be best to think things through. However, Tai butts in, declaring that he doesn't intend to go along with such plan. Huey was immediately alerted as our hero slowly walks towards her. She asks what Tai is planning to do, to which Tai states that he needs to stomp on the rat bastard first before anything else. Huey Yeon then stops him on his track, telling our boy not to commit violence against other humans. In response, our hero stares at her dead in the eyes while emitting an overwhelming energy, asking who will stop him from doing so. He emphasizes that the world has already collapsed, and the law is now meaningless. Despite our hero's intimidating presence, Huey didn't back down. She confronts our hero head-on, emphasizing that even though the world has been plunged into chaos, humans should not kill each other's. Tai looks straight into her eyes and comments that she is the same as ever. The tension is brewing in the city hall with our hero getting increasingly mad at Choi with the bastard's latest atrocity, capturing Lee Tion and Kang Jun. How will our hero respond to Huey Yeon's words? And what will Tai do to finally shut the loudmouth easy mode enjoyer, Choi? Stay tuned to find out in the next episode. Until next time.